Hey travellers, today we're going to be heading around the great outback, red sand and spin effects country. Let's go and take a gander. <laughs> yep. On your Aussie outback adventure, well you've got to remember it can be a pretty wild and unpredictable place this country. It can literally throw anything at you, you've got to be prepared. Whoa, it's a snake! It's a Flying snakes. No, nah, no, nah, see, that's just a rubber snake. Very funny. I'm afraid of snakes, you knew that. Now, a lot of people think of the Aussie outback as nothing but a dry, barren place with no life. But you know what? You get some pretty interesting plants out here. Take this one. Now, it looks a lot like Spinifex, but that's a nasty, spiky bush you've got to steer clear of. This fella is. Oh, oh crikey. Oh, that's clearly Spinifex. Oh, I tell you what. You know something I really love about the Aussie Outback? When you're out here, you're just miles from anywhere. There's nothing and no one. Just you, the bush. Serenity. we're going to be doing something just a little bit different. We're visiting the area of Winton in central western Queensland. Found 1,500 kilometres from Brisbane and 177 kilometres northwest of Longreach, this town has a population of 954 people and the main industries are sheep and cattle raising. This big sky country is known as the birthplace of the iconic Australian song Walsing Matilda by Banjo Patterson and is one of the founding towns of Qantas. But none of that is why we're here today in this spectacular landscape. We're here to discover dinosaurs. Back in 1999, local farmer David Elliott found a fossilised dinosaur bone whilst mustering sheep on land very close to where we are right now. And now this area is a hive of dinosaur activity with organised digs, a fossil lab, even a museum to show off the locals. While we're here in Winton, we're going to get a chance to find out about the geology of the area and why there are so many dinosaur fossils right here. We'll visit La Quarry, which is home to some pretty incredible dino footprints. We'll check out a lab where the fossils are prepared and of course, have a go at digging. And this is the site chosen for this year's dig where paleontologists are working alongside everyday citizens who just want to give it a bit of a go. It's about an hour outside of town and this is George who's going to be showing us around. Uh, George, how is it that you choose this particular site to start digging? Yeah, so this site here we, we found bone fragments that have been found sitting on the Blacksville Plains by the grazers in the area. Yep. Uh, they find those little pieces uh, and tell us the location of the sites and from there we we begin. So you're sort of looking for stuff on the surface initially. Um, do you start just digging down then? I mean, did, how do you how do you get to the fossil layer? Yeah. So from those initial sightings, we then uh, do new parades of so picking up all the bone fragments to try and find the centre point as to where the fossils sure. are. Uh, from that point, we then remove the topsoil layer, which can be about one to two metres thick, uh, until we hit a siltstone layer or, or a colour change. And it's in that layer, in that bed, that we bring in our participants so that they get a chance to uncover some of the, our own natural and ancient history. Well, this sounds very interesting. Do you think we can actually go and give it a bit of a go? Yeah, we sure can, Rob. Excellent. Yeah. Once you get all the dirt away and you've got rock left, how do you tell the difference between what's rock and what's fossilised bone? Uh, good question, Rob. Good question. Uh, it comes down to colour and texture. So we're constantly training our eyes for those uh, two features. And right here, this little piece is a very good example. We can notice it's fairly light coloration here, yep. but it's also full of texture. So this could possibly be a part of a rib surface. 
Whereas the rock on the other side, oh, yeah, it's quite different. much darker and very plain in texture. And that, that came out of the big piece of rock that everyone's working on at the moment, just over here. What else do you think might be in there? Yeah, here, so far what we've uncovered are a couple of big chunks of backbone or vertebrae from a, a massive long necked dinosaur or, or a sauropod. Um, but who knows what else we'll find today? Well, shall we get in there and give them a hand? Yeah, sure can, Rob. Well, this digging's got me thinking. Why is it that we find so many dinosaur fossils around here? Why can't I just dig for them anywhere? Well, it's probably no surprise to find out. It's got to do with the geology. <gasps> you look at this landscape and it is pretty phenomenal, but why is it so rich in dinosaur history? Well, we've come to a geological formation known as a jump up and we brought with us a paleontologist to try and find out. Uh, hello, Dr. Steve. Hello, Dr. Rob. So maybe you can shed a bit of a light for us on this area. Why is it so special? Well, we're surrounded down there by a rock that we call, a rock formation that we call the Winton Formation. And it's about 95 million years old, extends into Northern Territory, South Australia and New South Wales as well. Okay, so that is a pretty big rock formation. So I look around today and it's a fairly arid landscape, I guess, there's flies bugging me. Um, but 95 million years ago, what would we have been looking at around this area? Oh, it was quite different. It was still relatively flat, but because Australia was further south and connected to Antarctica, it was much wetter and it would have uh, had floods throughout the year. And what about what we're standing on here? We're sort of the jump up, we're up above everything else here. How would have this have formed? Well, the jump ups or mesas, which are flat topped hills, what they are is just a resistant part of the Winston Formation. So everything down there, the rocks used to be stacked up at least as high as we are now. But because this is resistant and that isn't, wind and water over time have just brought the Winton Formation down further down there than we are here. So given enough time and weather, it's just a road at all of those areas and just not these ones here. Exactly right. Okay, so we know that this area was very different 95 million years ago, but what makes this particular area so good for preserving dinosaur fossils? Well, the first thing and most important thing is the type of rock that we've got here. There are three ways that rocks can form. The first produces igneous rocks, so that's from lava, volcanoes, that sort of thing. Yep. The hot stuff below the Earth's crust. The second way is sedimentary, so rocks that are formed by floods, by rivers, by seas, or by wind. Just sort of sediment being laid down. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And the third is metamorphic rock, where you take a pre-existing rock and you heat it or you put it under pressure and it changes the type of rock that you've got. Okay, that makes sense completely. Now, given that you said this area was essentially, uh, there was a lot of water around and inland sea, maybe even around this area a long time ago, I presume most of the rock around here then is sedimentary. Exactly right. And sedimentary rock is good for finding dinosaur fossils? It is indeed. If you had a dinosaur living in a volcano crater, which is unlikely, it would just get cooked. You'd never get the fossils preserved. If you had a rock that was metamorphic, it would have warped them. But a sedimentary rock preserves them perfectly. It buries them so predators don't eat them. Keeps them safe for us 95 million years later. Exactly right. So we've got the right kind of rock around this area, the sedimentary rock. Uh, what else do we need? Well. It's a good thing that the Winston Formation was formed in a period of time called the Cretaceous Period, and specifically, the Winston Formation was made 95 million years ago. So at that time, we had dinosaurs on the planet. Um, in the Winston Formation, we find a lot of evidence of sauropod dinosaurs, big, long-necked, four-legged herbivores, and they were living in this area. It was a floodplain. It wasn't underwater when the Winston Formation was formed, so these dinosaurs loved living in that environment. So you get the right rock formation, the right time period, the right weather conditions, and you get all of these fossils. That's right. But it's not just bones we find in the Winton Formation. We find footprints as well. We've actually got the only dinosaur stampede on the planet at La Quarry Conservation Park. Footprints, dinosaur stampede. This sounds incredible. Will you be able to show us it? Absolutely. Well, stick around for something you cannot see anywhere else in the world. Whoa, 
welcome back to Scope. Today we are in the Winton area of Western Queensland, a place that is known, amongst other things, for its giant former tenants, dinosaurs. And Steve the paleontologist is about to take us on a tour of a dinosaur stampede here at the Lark Quarry Conservation Park. Wow, Steve, so this is it, this is Lark Quarry. This is it, the only dinosaur stampede on the planet. Amazing. So, oh, well, so a stampede, that's basically when a whole lot of animals get spooked and run away in a bit of chaos, yeah? Exactly right. How was this discovered? It was found by a farmer in the 1960s. It was uncovered by a big group of volunteers in the 1970s. And then it, we worked out what was going on in the 1980s. Wow, do you think we could actually get up close and take a look at their footprints? I think we could. Let's go. Steve, we've taken our shoes off to try and preserve the area in its current form. But correct me if I'm wrong, these footprints are 95 million years old. That's right. Now, your average footprint does not last that long, so why are these ones still here? Basically because these footprints were formed in a sort of thick, thick clay-like soil. And uh, these animals have come in, they've left their footprints there, and then it's dried out in the sun for a bit. It's become hard, and only after that has water brought in more soil and dirt to cover over. And they've been covered over to be protected, because obviously if they've just stayed there, they would have crumbled and gone to dust eventually, exactly. wouldn't they? Yes. So they've been covered over and protected, and then, I guess what, just over time, it's turned to uh, the rock we have here now. Exactly right. So another thing, you've got a lot of footprints here. Mm -hmm. Why is it you think it might be a stampede? It's essentially because we have over 3,000 footprints from over 100 different animals, all moving in one direction. Uh, it was originally thought, you know, could be migrating animals, animals moving from place sure. to place to follow food. But now it's thought to be a stampede. Now all the littler ones here that I can see around, they're all heading that way. That's right. Except for this one here, huge footprint here and a few more all in a line, mm -hmm. all heading in the opposite direction. Is that what you think spooked? The masses. It is indeed. We think that these footprints were left behind by a big meat-eating dinosaur and he's trapped this group of smaller dinosaurs against something they can't run over and so they've had to run in the opposite direction and to, to escape from escape him. past him. Do you think we can take a bit more of a look around at some of the prints? I think so. With so many footprints around the area, how did you try and decide what sort of dinosaurs left them? Do you start with, uh, I suppose, the number of toes, the size of the footprint, the, the depth of the footprint? How, how do you do it? Yeah, that's exactly how we would start. Uh, we'd look at the shape, we'd look at the size. Um, all these footprints were made from dinosaurs that we did not have any bones for when these, bo when these footprints were discovered. So back in the 60s when they found these, they didn't know of any dinosaurs in this area, they know no fossil not, records. Not any of these types anyway. So they had to look at dinosaurs from overseas and they looked at the two different uh, small footprint types yep. and they worked out that one belonged to a group of meat eaters, one belonged to a group of plant eaters. What about the massive footprints though, the, the, the one that caused this stampede? Well, when they were originally found, because of their size, we thought they were from a very big meat-eating dinosaur, something like Tyrannosaurus rex. And that was fair enough, because we didn't know of any meat-eating dinosaur bones in the Winton area. But then, in 2009, a dinosaur nicknamed Banjo, but more properly called Australovenator, was found, and he is a meat-eating dinosaur with rather large feet for his size. Uh -huh. And if you tried to, I don't know, some sort of a reconstruction from the bones that you've found to see if it fits the footprint? We have indeed. We've got the whole back leg, so we fleshed it out, put muscle on it, put skin on it. They've brought it to the trackways and the shoe fits. Aha, uh -huh. so I think we have our suspect. Um, look, this is really interesting, uh, very amazing. And look, the only place in the world you can actually see something like this. It's pretty darn important on any outback adventure. You know exactly where you are and exactly where you're going. Now for today, we're going to be heading due west. I don't have a compass with me, but I don't need one. I've got this inbuilt knowledge of the outback and the elements. So let's head. Oh, it's the other way. Yeah, and no, I was just uh, taking a quick peek over there, but uh, west is this way, definitely. Well, Lark Quarry was incredible. Really paints a great picture of a, a moment in time, a very long time ago. But we are back at the dig site. Uh, we are back with George, who has covered a fossil in alfoil, and I'm sure there's a good reason for that that you're about to let us know. Yes. 
So what we've done here, Rob, we have covered the fossil in our foil. We do this just before we get it ready for a plaster jacket. Okay, now why do you put a plaster jacket around it? Yeah, so we put the plaster jacket around it to help preserve that piece and it also makes it easier for us to transport back to the laboratory. That first layer of alfoil is there to keep the moisture away from the fossil. Because next we're going to add some wet newspaper. That's there for extra padding as well as to help the plaster set. And lastly of course comes the plaster. <laughs> well there you go, who knew you wrapped a fossil up in a plaster cast? I certainly didn't. What happens to it next? Well we will find out as well as some more amazing dinosaur facts, so stay tuned. Welcome back to a prehistoric episode of Scope. We're actually out near Winton at a dinosaur dig site. And uh, what we've got under here is a dinosaur fossil inside a rock, inside a plaster jacket. George and I did just a moment ago. The next step is to flip it over and then cover the other side. How are you going there, George? Oh, oh yeah, it's yeah, good. We're, we're going, going well, We've got a bit of movement. We're going well. Now, what's yeah. going to happen to this specimen once we actually get the full plaster jacket on it? So once we have the full plaster jacket on it, this piece will be sent to our laboratory for preparation or us cleaning up the fossil ready for display. Oh, that sounds good. Um, do you think we might be able to take a look at that at some point? Yeah, you sure can. I'll take you for a tour around our laboratory. That sounds good. Well, anyway, let's, let's get this flipped over and yeah. see, we'll see what we can find. Then we'll roll it this way. That way? Yep. yep. Oh, that's a quick... oh, look at that. There we are. Beauty. Now we're just going to cap her off and send to the lab. That's it. Easy. So here we are, Rob. This is the largest and most productive work in the laboratory in the southern hemisphere. Wow, amazing. So these guys are actually getting the, the fossilised bones out right now. They are, yeah, yeah, yeah. But last I saw, we had kind of a big plaster jacket full. How does it go from sort of there to here, I guess, or where are all of those? We did. All those jackets are stored just around the corner. We might head around there now. Alrighty. Yeah. So this is where we keep them all, Rob. Wow, so they're all labelled the way it looks like with the year they were dug up and the, the site they were dug up from. That's it, yeah. And it looks like you've got quite a bad backlog here, so it's obviously quicker to dig them up than it is to get the bones out of there. It sure is, Rob. At the moment, this is only 17 weeks of digging, but there's already 10 years of preparation for our laboratory. Wow. So it's going to take 10 years to get the bones out of them all. That is pretty amazing. So from here, we then take them out of the back, cut them open, and we start our preparation. And we have one open today. So George, it looks like uh, this jacket here has already been cut in half and we can see what's on the inside. Um, what exactly am I looking at? Yeah, so what we got here Rob, this is a, a nice leg bone from a, a long neck dinosaur. We think this could be possibly the upper front leg bone from a long neck dinosaur. Uh, also known as a humerus. Uh, it's quite funny isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we've got a humerus from a sauropod here. Now this looks like a pretty amazing specimen. Was there originally rock and stuff all over the top of it? That's correct Rob. Yeah, originally this jacket would have been about this high initially and we've cut the top off and worked our way down to expose, expose the fossil. Look is it possible to find a, maybe a smaller less important fossil sample that I can have a bit of a go at you know getting the, the stone away from the fossilised bone. Yeah, we sure can, Rob. And All we right. can send it up here in the laboratory. Excellent. Yeah, come on through. So what exactly have you got for me to work on here? All right, Rob, what we're looking at here, this is roughly half a toe from a long neck dinosaur. Half a toe? Half a toe. <laughs> it was a big toe, wasn't it? So how do you tell the difference between what is rock and what is bone? That's a good question, Rob. It's colour and texture. Okay. So on here at the moment, these darker areas, yep. that's the fossilised bone. Uh, yep. These lighter areas here is a rock that we need to remove. That's we need to get away. Uh, we use this tool to remove the rock. And all we do is literally sit down and colour in. Um, so it's a little air-powered jackhammer, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It works like a mini jackhammer. Looks and sounds a bit like a dentist tool. Oh, um, and all we do is, yeah, sit down and, uh, and colour in. Just like that, it breaks Just it like off. Just like that, yeah. Right, so, oh, I might yeah, have a go with that. Yeah, yeah. This is quite fun. Do you think we might be able to take a bit of a look at what the other guys are working on as well? Yeah, sure can, Rob. I might sure can. A little more, though. <laughs> no worries, mate. 
it's, I've been working on it for about three days now. Um, it's very delicate, very frustrating. Um, if you hit it the wrong way with the tool, it wants to fall to pieces. But um, very addictive at the same time. In this jacket here, we have a dinosaur that's known as Matilda. It's a big sauropod dinosaur. For some reason, Matilda's actually quite crushed in this jacket. It's quite hard to work on. But we think it's probably because she's been stood on prior to being buried and, and fossilised. So it's quite a fun project. It's probably been here a year. It's one of our long-term projects. Just because it's so difficult and the rock is really hard. So once all of the rock's been chipped away, you end up with something looking a little bit like this. And this is a, a, a piece of a rib, is that right? It is, yeah. That's it, Rob. Yeah, so a, a beautiful end of a rib here. Unfortunately, it has broken on either end um, prior to fossilisation. However, those pieces may be here in our collection. So once we've cleaned up these fossils, we cover them in a solution known as paraloid. That helps strengthen, preserve and coat the fossils for the future. And what is the future for a fossil? So once you've got this, what is it, a, a half or a fifth of a rib, where does it go from here? Yeah, from here, uh, it'll wait for the paleontologist to study it, so the official paperwork, yep. and then they can go on display here in our museum. Uh, right. If you like, we might head over and, and what see we a few got. we prepared earlier. That's it. Excellent. <laughs> And this is the famous uh, banjo. This is, this is banjo, or Australovenator wintonensis, uh, a carnivorous dinosaur or theropod. Um, very unique species, brand new to the world uh, and unique to Australia. Mm. And it ran on two legs by the look of it, rather than four like the sauropods. That's right, yeah, yeah, it ran on two legs, so this tells us it could have ran very fast, and the feet are very similar to birds today. Very interesting. Oh, very sharp teeth and very sharp claws. Um, and is this all we're going to find of banjo and Matilda, do you think? This is what we found so far, but there's potentially more waiting for us in the laboratory. And maybe, who knows, what else is, you know, out there. Yeah. <laughs> On any outback adventure, one of the little pests you're going to encounter a lot of are the flies. There can be hundreds of them out here. Unless you're wearing one of Aussie Bob's patented shirts. You see, they're infused with cow manure, and the flies hate this stuff. <laughs> now, I think we're gonna head, uh, yeah, probably this way next. Yeah. All of this digging is, is pretty fun. It's very meticulous, it can be time consuming, but ultimately also pretty rewarding when you come across a, a fossilized bone buried inside the rock there. At least that's what I think, but I've only been doing it for today. Let's see what some of these people think. I've been on digs since 2003. This is my eighth dig. They're all completely different, all very exciting. So I think banjo, the theropod, is by far one of my favourites. Banjo, being our only carnivore, is very, very special. I've been into dinosaurs since I hatched. I've always, since I was a kid, been mad on dinosaurs. Well, this has been my first dig. They just let you get right in there and do everything and work alongside you and teach you how it's done. This particular dinosaur is really interesting, very challenging. The bones are consolidated in very solid rock. It's hard work, but it's really rewarding. This particular dinosaur is a really large sauropod, so a long-necked dinosaur. The vertebrae suggest so. I'd like to think there's something else in there, but at the moment it's just one animal. So, George, this was literally just uncovered. Um, what are we looking at? Yeah, sure, is, Rob. So what we're looking at here is a small section of rib from a massive long-necked dinosaur. And this one here was quite uh, soft, if that's the right way to put it, compared to some of the other fossilised bones. Yeah, no, that's correct, Rob. Yeah, very fragile piece this one, but uh, a beautiful break, so it'll be easy to piece back together later yeah, on. That looks great. Look, thanks so much for your time, uh, your help in showing us around. It has been amazing. Uh, and I'm afraid that that's it from Wondrous Winton in this dinerific episode, but there are so many memories. Like the geological jump up, the once in a lifetime Lark Quarry, and the Southern Hemisphere's biggest fossil preparation lab. And if you missed any of this prehistoric perfection, well, don't worry, you can find it all on our website. And don't forget to dig deep. Next time when the ordinary becomes extraordinary. Under the scope. <laughs>